Firstly, a, uh, a welcome to those members at the back who have just joined us from the National Driving Club. We are very pleased to have you with our uh, annual ATM flying bomber. So, welcome to you. And now it is my enormous pleasure to welcome Captain Eric Winkle Brown and his wife Jean, who are going to talk to us today. The greatest turnout of members we've ever had is testament to the legend. Thank you. Our normal attendance is mainly 35 to 40, and we have 91 of our members today. This is the best turnout we've ever had in our entire history. So, we have to an example of what you mean to us today. I have an almost impossible job to introduce you today. I doubt there's any one of you in this room who has not heard of Eric Winkle Brown. Captain Eric Winkle Brown and the extraordinary achievements of his lifetime. How do you condense into a few sentences the life and background of a man who's done so much in his long and illustrious life? Some years ago, I took a couple of veteran World War II members to a reunion at Project Palace, if you remember. And you were the guest speaker at that point. In those days, my knowledge of the war was from books and films and first-hand accounts from friends' parents who had been involved in the conflict of the Second World War. I was less spellbound by what I heard on that occasion, and I felt honoured to be in the presence of a group of people who have done so much for the preservation of our country, for our generation and beyond. Both in peacetime and in wartime, it was the essential work of these brave people, the test pilots, working without the benefit of days of today's computer modeling, which takes the majority of the risk out of testing the new machines, that put their lives on the line on a daily basis to find out the shortcomings in the designs of the machines they were in and to work out how to overcome and improve. It was they who gave our pilots in the war the reliability of the machines that saw the war won. We wonder what it must have been like for our pilots to have been in that conflict, and some of them to have had to bail out from their aircraft when they were in difficulties. Some pilots having the misfortune to have had to bail out multiple times. Just to run on this fact, your speaker today has bailed out an aircraft 21 times <laughs> <laughs> and has been fished out of the sea 15 times. <laughs> I will let our speaker tell his first-hand story, but we are enormously grateful to you to come and speak today, and we're looking forward to it immensely. Captain Eric Kukumra. It's a great pleasure to come with you. This was one of my stamping grounds in World War II. Came down here often, flying Lancasters and gliders and what have you. Now, it's um, always a pleasure to talk to people who are, in the main, associated with aviation. But before I go on, can you hear all right in the back? Yes, yes, yes. Right. right. Now I'm going to take you back to the year 1944. This was a key year in World War II. To begin with, D-Day was behind us by June and we had established a footage in Europe. Just when it looked as if things may be going our way a bit, this country was suddenly subjected to an avalanche of weaponry which was of the advanced technology type. Firstly, in Germany we got rumours back, well not rumours, but quite 
saw the reports back from RF pilots who had not engaged any of these aircraft but had seen them and were impressed with the speed of their jet aircraft and their rocket aircraft. Rocket aircraft was something totally new to us. Then, when we got over that first shock, there came the avalanche of the V-1s. Now the V-1 was a flying bomb that flew at steady 400 miles an hour at a height of usually at about 2,000 feet. And very, very difficult to catch with an airplane because we didn't have a single fighter at that time that could fly at 400 miles an hour at 2,000 feet. Take it up to 20,000, we can do well about that, but not at 2,000. So, it was decided we'd have to do something about it. Anyway, while all this was going on, um, Fortunately, anti-aircraft fire was very effective against the V-1. But fighters were stuck, and we were asked to develop the engines in these fighters temporarily to give the power that would take them to 400 miles an hour, 2,000 feet. This involved using, normally used 100 octane aviation fuel. But, to get the power, we moved to 150 octane aromatic fuel. It certainly did the job, but, of course, the engine was subjected to huge stresses and it had to be checked after every flight. The scale of the attack of the V1s may astonish you. There were 5,000 launched successfully against the UK. And uh, this was followed soon after by an even worse weapon, the V2, which was, of course, a guided missile with supersonic performance. So the bomb arrived, and that was the first you knew of it, followed by a bang because it had broken the sound barrier. So there we were, we were faced with all these things. The V2, there were 1,250 launched against Britain, again successfully. So the scale was pretty heavy. Churchill was getting pretty perturbed about all this. So he came out to Farnborough to have a chat with us all and said, look, we'll win the war, right? But we've got to do something about this German advanced technology. We must find out how we have achieved it and uh, catch up with it all. So, he said to the director of the RE, Mr. Farron, he said, form a mission, we'll call it the Farron mission, and I want you to take a team of pilots and scientists into Germany as soon as you can after the capitulation. Germany's given up. 
So, he said, I have three priorities. Firstly, I want you to find the high-speed wind tunnels and find out how they're constructed and, if necessary, bring them back block, stock and barrel to the UK. Secondly, I want you to find the top advanced jet and rocket aircraft. Bring them back to the UK if there are still any in fit state and we will test them here. Thirdly, I want you to go interrogate their top scientists, manufacturers, test pilots, etc. Now I was appointed chief pilot to this lot and chief interpreter. I spoke German fluently, but I've been a school teacher in Germany before the war. And um, it was a very exciting time ahead. Now we had to wait, of course, till things evolved. Mr. Fan got together the team he wanted, uh, but this was not ready till about January 1945. And um, it was decided that we must wait for somebody in the Second Army, the British Second Army, to alert us that they had come across anything which we we go and check on. Because remember, the war was still going on. We got our first alert on the 14th of April, 1945. And at that time, we um, got a call from the Second Army saying, we've overrun a Luftwaffe airfield at Fassberg, just south of Hanover. We have found two aircraft, we think are advanced jets, and the, all we know about them is um, they were here when we arrived, Two pilots had come in with them, dumped them, fleeing from the Russians, and just left them here. Well, this was wonderful. The first exciting thing, of course, was these were the two that two like this. Of all the aircraft we wanted, this was the top one. And here there were two on the Sheffield in apparently top-notch condition. So, I flew over on the 14th of April and looked these over. And let me show you a few points about this. This was the most formidable aircraft of World War II. Without any doubt. I'm not getting a... Oh yes, I have a You see the fuselage here? It's like a shark fuselage. A shark's body. This sort of thing can only be found out if you have supersonic wind tunnels. Now here we were, one of the top aviation countries in the world. We didn't have a supersonic wind tunnel, neither did the Americans, nor the Soviets, nor the French. 
No ally had their supersonic wind tunnel. The Italians had won, preparing in the earlier days for the Schneider Trophy races, and the Germans had a multitude of them. So, this is the type of thing you get, and you can work out if you have a supersonic wind tunnel. The aircraft also had a swept back wings. Today, every airline in the world has swept back wings. Those days, totally new to us. What did they do for you? Well, remember at this stage in aviation history, the Holy Grail was to achieve supersonic flight. And to do that, you obviously have to have very thin wings. If you, if they are straight, they will have a big struggle. In fact, they will not get through the transonic region. If you have swept wings, the more you sweep them back, the easier you will find to progress through the transonic region, but you will not get right through to supersonic speed. So it's three quarters of the way. The other very vital thing about this lot, the jet engine slung underneath the body here. Now I worked a lot with Frank Whistle, who was the development of, the developer of the jet engine. And um, I said to Frank, look, you know all about axial flow, which these are, but you've chosen to go on the principle of centrifugal. Why have you done that? Now, just for a minute, I'm going to explain. Don't panic, girls. I'm going to do a little bit. Just for a minute. A jet engine really has three parts. A compressor, combustion chambers, turbines. Air is compressed, heated up, speeded up, and it goes into the turbines, which eject it at high speed, giving you a thrust. That is the centrifugal flow principle. The axial flow, the Germans have first copied us, but then moved to this. In different series, you have multiple compressors, combustion chambers, multiple turbines. You make them of small diameter so you get a much slimmer engine for a given amount of power. So every jet engine today is axial flow. So the Germans were a jump ahead of us at this stage with this engine. The other thing about this aircraft was the firepower. If you look right up at the front, right up at the front of the aircraft, that's it, yes. You'll see four 30 millimeter cannons. We didn't print them that time, we're using 20 millimeter. 30 millimeter four is a huge punch and will bring down a bomber without any problem. There was one snag to this aircraft. <coughs> it did not have dive brakes. We made the same mistake with our first jet. We didn't realize how fast they went 
and to slow them down for landing or for formation flying, you needed air brakes. So, this gave a problem. This aircraft was specifically built to kill B-17 flying fortresses which the Americans were using in daylight. So, if you attack, you dive down on the bomber from the stern, picking up a huge amount of speed, but since you've no dive brakes, you can't dissipate that speed. You come in, these guns, these 30 millimeter guns, were only accurate up to 600 yards. So, you would open fire at 600 yards, closing very rapidly, and you would have to break away at about 200 yards to prevent colliding with your target. So, that gives you two seconds firing time. You cannot sight and fire in two seconds. You can only point your aircraft in the general direction of the target and hope for the best. But, of course, with a spread of 430 mil, it's usually a very good best. If you had dive brakes, you could have come in, opened fire at 600 yards, popped your dive brakes, slowed down, you'd be able to get an extra two seconds. So you'd have four seconds instead of two. In that time, you have time to both sight and fire. So you're much more accurate. But, this aircraft was ahead of its day. Interestingly enough too, these early jets, the German ones had no ejection seats. So when you got into this cockpit, it was a bit like being in a tin coffin. There wasn't much you could do to bear light at the speeds this thing could achieve. <coughs> Let's understand how tremendous performance this aircraft had. When I brought it back to Farnborough, I tested it out. The top Allied fighter at the end of World War II was the Mark 14 Spitfire, which had a top speed 446 miles an hour. 446. When I tested this, top speed 568. Now, 125 miles an hour, faster than our fastest fighter. We weren't even the same league. Of course, you don't dog fight with an airplane like <coughs> this, because it's got too high a wing. You just slash at your target, blast him with speed and firepower, and go off. <coughs> 